Hey everybody, I'd like to have a sort of uh, informal little chat about statistics and stereotypes. Statistics is the study of the collection, analysis, interpretation, presentation, and organization of data. A stereotype is a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. So, now that that's perfectly clear, the big important issue here is to realize that science is descriptive, not prescriptive. Science can describe the natural world, but it doesn't tell you how you ought to live, and it doesn't tell you how your biases are affecting your description. Even if you could make the case that such and such a person has such and such biological aptitude, does not and cannot tell you what that person ought to do about it. An important and hotly debated idea in regards to the role of science in human culture is radical reductionism. Reductionism is the concept that all phenomena can be described in reference to its constituent parts. For example, an idea like patriotism is described by psychology. Psychology is described by biology. Biology is chemistry. Chemistry is physics. Physics is math. And so on. But reductionism must inevitably lead to the idea of determinism. In determinism, we find no room for idiosyncratic personality to have any spontaneous or unpredictable effect on our lives. Fortunately or unfortunately, radical reductionism is self-defeating. Just on the surface, it presupposes emergentism, but itself demands a full account of the causal chain of events, which, when you go and check, falls apart in a cloud of wave functions and dynamism. That is to say that science is by its very nature statistical. The reducibility of a phenomenon depends on how closely you look at it. There are no certainties in outcomes, even in our universe seemingly ordered by natural laws. There is certainly a solution set, but no predetermination. And the higher up the physical scale we go, the less predictable it becomes. And by higher up, I don't mean just size, but complexity. Arguably, life itself and intelligence are the most complex things there are. For example, if all you knew about Abraham Lincoln was that he was an uneducated second son from the forested American frontier, you would be statistically right to say he had no chance of ever becoming president. From a non-anthropocentric perspective, this statistical level is abstract and completely arbitrary. Only because it is humanity that is studying humanity are statistics calculated at a certain level of generalization. While statistics definitely have their value, there is the danger that this generality can drown the individual. To ignore what makes someone unique is to rob them of their inherent complexity. Complexity could be good or bad, I don't care. But complexity is an inalienable property of the human condition. Taking that away based on a tenuous belief in statistical probability is as heinous an act as any larceny. You have to look at the sample size of the statistic. Ask yourself whether the amount of people considered can truly represent a much larger segment. But when is the segment large enough? It is tempting to insist that sample sizes need to be in the millions. But then how can you justify saying anything about the individual from such a large segment? Not to mention, averages can be misleading. Here's an excerpt from a recent article in the New York Times. Averages are useful because many traits, behaviors, and outcomes are distributed in a bell-shaped curve, with most results clustered around the middle and a much smaller group of outliers at the high and low ends. Knowing the average number of births in an area can help builders decide how many bedrooms are likely to be needed in new houses and alert policymakers to a brewing fertility crisis. But averages can be misleading when a distribution is heavily skewed at one end, with a small number of unrepresentative outliers pulling the average in their direction. In 2011, for example, the average income of the 7,878 households in Steubenville, Ohio, was $46,341. But if just two people, Warren Buffett and Oprah Winfrey, relocated to that city, the average household income in Steubenville would rise 62% overnight to $75,263 per household. Outliers can also pull an average down, leading social scientists to overstate the risks of particular events. Most children of divorced parents turn out to be as well-adjusted as children of married parents, but the much smaller number who lead very troubled lives can lower the average outcome for the whole group, producing exaggerated estimates of the impact of divorce. 
I'm not advocating that we give up on averages. Used cautiously, they help to analyze patterns and formulate policies. But given the variety of circumstances that exist in the messy real world, we ought to think twice before doling out one-size-fits-all advice to individuals on the basis of averages. This is a squishy issue. It's often almost impossible to know just how statistics, stereotypes, and the truth interact. Consider this excerpt from Native American author Sherman Alexie's short story, An Indian Education. At the Farm Town High School dance, after a basketball game in an overheated gym where I had scored 27 points and pulled down 13 rebounds, I passed out during a slow song. As my white friends revived me and prepared to take me to the emergency room, where doctors would later diagnose my diabetes, the Chicano teacher ran up to us. Hey, he said, what's that boy been drinking? I know all about these Indian kids. They start drinking real young. Sharing dark skin doesn't necessarily make two men brothers. The point, the point is that the teacher was making a vocal diagnosis based on a stereotype about Indians and alcoholism. But on the other hand, certain statistical studies would seem to justify his intuition. So I have to ask, can you be offended by a statistical probability? You know that you've been described as both an explorer and an exploder of Indian stereotype. And, and alcohol is surely one of the most persistent stereotypes, correct? It's not a stereotype. It's a damp, damp reality. I mean, Native Americans have an epidemic rate of alcoholism. If you are statistically likely to encounter this or that situation, wouldn't you want to know about it? It never hurts to know the odds, right? But never let other people simplify you. Stats are like recommendations, though not everyone seems to understand that. The interesting thing is that Alexei is in no way contradicting himself. He's absolutely pointing to the messy reality of our world seen at different levels. And we have to think about society as a multi-tiered morass, not of historical facts, but of historical ideas. Until recently, people only migrated slowly across the earth. Today, we move faster and faster, we mix more, and social, ethnic, and national identities tend to overlap, if not contradict. Throughout history, races have been assimilated, isolated, expelled, or even exterminated in a never-ending cycle of diaspora and homecoming. Race is an inscription of that demographic history written genetically and thus geography can be incidentally linked to certain racial characteristics. These characteristics are not discrete categories, and no set paradigms efficiently or even sufficiently separate one from the other, creating a lot of confusion over ethnicity and nationality. For example, what is the difference between an Iranian and a Persian? Is it ethnic, national, religious, socioeconomic? I don't know. Despite these slippery details, statistics can be medically useful. On an individual level, statistics can help us assess inescapable risks. For example, should I get a rabies shot when I wake up with a bat in my bedroom? If race is formulated as a continuum of the effects of genetic drift through migration, it can help health and insurance officials prevent and diagnose both genetic and non-communicable diseases, such as cystic fibrosis in Europeans lactose intolerance in everyone except Europeans, sickle cell anemia in southern Europeans and Africans, Tay-Sachs disease or hypertension. There does seem to be real empirical evidence that these diseases have a higher prevalence in certain gene pools, but is it primarily biological, cultural, or individual? Statistics can be confounded and or conflated. Consider something as innocuous and obvious as eating your veggies. Vegetables are statistically correlated with health, but do they cause it? Veggies are also linked to wealth. Wealth and health are statistically inseparable. So when you see higher rates of illness associated with poor nutrition, can you shrug it off and say, well, if only those people would eat their vegetables? Or do you have to consider the complicated and uncomfortable fact that on a statistical level, the unhealthiest are always the unwealthiest? As preeminent sociobiologist E.O. Wilson pointed out in his book On Human Nature, Although racial and ethnic interests may prevail temporarily, socioeconomic classes are paramount in the long run. The strength and scope of an individual's ethnic identity are determined by the general interests of his socioeconomic class. Some think religion and culture are geographically predetermined. Therefore, because geography and genetics often coincide, 
Racial differences are both or neither cultural or biological. Race is not only an invention, it's also constantly changing. Who is what race? Who decides? Is skin color the most important aspect of race? Is it statistical or stereotypical? Many times, simple economic factors determine race and stereotype. For example, in the 18th century, the market for sugar encouraged slavery. Tropical climates and diseases dictated the race of the slaves. The race of the slaves dictated the attitudes of the dominant class to justify slavery. But there's no denying that stereotypes are a type of fiction. Fiction uses stereotypes as tropes, a kind of shorthand for certain characteristics. Fiction, in turn, influences real life, and people often mix those two up, often with fiction being the larger part. Statistics influence stereotypes and vice versa. Biases based on stereotypes often alter the collection, interpretation, and presentation of that data. Fiction doesn't just imitate life, but it also imitates other fiction, thus reinforcing attitudes and misinformed beliefs about race, gender, sexuality, and class. While censorship is dangerous, it is also, because of this, sometimes necessary. We should never let anyone censor us, but sometimes we ought to censor ourselves. Many scientists believe environment shapes our behavior. Statistically, there is some justification for this, but it can't explain the ubiquitous outliers. By definition, statistics and stereotypes ignore exceptions, thus proving any explanatory power they have is only general. And we as individuals must remain vigilant and responsible. On a final note, I want us all to remember that statistics and stereotypes represent expected values of probabilities, which can be and often are distorted by experts with interests differing from our own. A complicated, nuanced, suspicious, and informed attitude towards statistics and stereotypes is what turns knowledge into power. There's plenty more that could be said on this topic, and I look forward to seeing and hearing your responses. Thanks for watching.